<clears throat> All right. There's exactly no one here, uh, which is fine because I'm just starting. I'm not planning on there being anyone here immediately. <clears throat> I'm narrating now because I'm probably going to upload this later because that's that's not a bad idea. Just this is a cheap way of making easy content um <laughs> but yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna do some practice if anyone if wants to hop into the chat and have a have a chat that's fine you, you're welcome to do that i'm gonna do some practice i think i'll start with some ones i already know just to warm myself up and then i want to practice an alpaluca story i want to practice garo Dierla. i might need to rem remind myself some of the details of that uh michael roberts i want to practice as well so that's what we're going to be doing all right what's a good one to start with a good one to start with um i think i think i'll start with the legend of nakfirna Now, there's a great many people who are very free and easy in using the word fairy. But here in Ireland, that's not a very good idea. You see, they hate that word. They hate it when people call them fairies. They prefer to be referred to as things like the good folk, the little people, the good neighbours, the gentry, things like that. And to be perfectly honest, if you call someone something they've already said they don't want to be called, and you ignore them in your own rudeness and have to face consequences for that, then that's your own fault, isn't it? That's just a very rude thing to do. And it's the same with the fairies. Now, there was a man from County Limerick named Carol O'Daly, and he was a very rude man indeed. He had no manners for his friends or his family, no manners for the people of the town or strangers on the street, and he especially had no manners for the good folk, whom he didn't even believe in. Now, one day he was riding his horse along the road into town past Knockfearna Hill. And as he was riding along, he came upon a farmer on a white horse going in the same direction. And being very bored, he turned to the farmer and he said, Sure, where is it you're heading yourself? Ah, oh, sure, I'm heading up to the top of the hill. What's a long way to be going? What has you heading up there? Ah, oh, sure, I'm just going up to talk with the good folk. You're going all the way to the top of the hill. To talk with the fairies. Sure, that's nonsense. They're not real. Don't be calling them that, said the farmer, very much taken aback. That'll be a curse on the both our heads. And so the farmer fell into uncomfortable silence. Very unhappy with the disrespect Carol O'Daly was showing the good folk. They rode alongside each other in tense quiet for several minutes until they came upon a fork in the road with a path leading to the top of Knockfearna Hill. Now the farmer, he turned onto this path and he rode all the way to the top of the hill. Carol O'Daly, he kept riding past until a thought overcame him. I don't believe he's gone all the way up there to talk to the fairies. So sure, that's nonsense. I want to know what he's really up to. So he tied up his horse at the bottom of the hill. And he began to slowly, quietly creep up the path. Not wanting the farmer to hear that he was coming. When he reached the top, he peered through the hedgerow trying to catch a glimpse at the farmer. But all that he could see was the farmer's white horse dancing and prancing across the grass. 
but no sign of the farmer. Now eventually he lost patience. He shoved his way through the hedgerow to look for the farm. But all that he could find was a wide, deep hole. And he thought to himself, I've heard of the pool dive of Nakfirna. People say it's a doorway to the fairy world. There's no such thing as that. I'll knock on the door to prove it. Now it may, occur, uh, it may occur to you that this is just a hole in the ground. How on earth could he possibly knock on the door? But Carol O'Dady, he was a very intelligent man. That's a lie. He was an absolute idiot. He went off and he found a big stone, bigger than the two of his fists together. He dragged it over to the hole, raised it up above his head, and he flung it down with all the strength he could muster. And he leaned over the hole, listening to the stone as it clattered off the rocks, trying to hear when it landed at the bottom. When suddenly, it shot back up out of the hole with more strength than he'd flung it in with. It smashed him in the face and sent him rolling back down to the bottom of the hill. The next morning, Carol O'Daly woke up where he had landed the afternoon before, next to his horse at the bottom of the hill. His front was all covered in blood from his nose. His nose itself was broken in two places, and his face was all battered and bruised from where the stone had struck him. And from that day forward, Carol O'Daly never, ever, referred to the good folk as fairies ever again. All right, so that's a nice little warm-up. Hello, Piper. Hello. It's nice to have you here. <laughs> All right, so. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, okay, that's one warm-up story. Could I could do another warm-up story before getting into things. Piper, Piper, is there a story that you have heard me do that you would like me to do again? I need to warm up anyway, so if you have any requests, go for it. <laughs> as long as it's not the Voyage of St. Brendan. <laughs> That was, that was hell. <laughs> I could maybe get up as far as Jason the fish. <laughs> I like the Voyage of St. Brendan. All of them. <laughs> all right, all right. Um... In that case, I'm going to do, I'm going to do one that's not on the channel. It's one I do in work sometimes. Um, I have two leprechaun stories that I do at work. One that I do if, one that I do nearly every day, nearly every tour, which is, we call it the Red Sox story. It's, it's not a great story, honestly. Um... Because most leprechaun stories are actually a bit shit. I'm going to be entirely honest. But there's another one that I do. Uh, I only do it if the people I have on the tour have either requested that I do some of the darker stuff. Or they're misbehaving. If they're being rude and, and talkative and annoying... I will do this story as punishment, almost, just to just to kind of shut them up, because, uh, because well, you'll see, you'll see. I think, yeah, I'm going to do that one. I don't have a name for it. I've never seen the name of it. I'm bad at remembering names anyway. Well, names of stories and things like that. But yeah, I'm going to do my grim leprechaun story. <sighs> Many, many years ago, 
there was a young woman named Eileen. And she was being courted by a young man from the neighbouring village. As they spent a lovely day together. They went out and had a picnic in the fields. And then, as the sun began to set, they went inside and they danced and they ate and they talked until the sun finished setting. It was time for Eileen to leave. As she returned to her home in her village. And she took a path through the woods that separated the two villages. A path she had taken many, many times through woods that she knew well. But that night, as she walked that path, she heard music from among the trees. Oh, Eileen knew well enough that you should never hear, you should never follow music you hear from the woods at night. But it was such beautiful music. And Eileen, she was a great woman for a dance and it had such a wonderful beat. She couldn't hold herself back. So she went in amongst the trees looking for the source of this music. And she came upon a clearing, brightly lit, with a fire burning in the middle. And by the fire sat four leprechauns who were playing the music. One with a tin whistle, one with a fiddle, one with a harp, and one pounding upon a bow rod. And around the fire danced a troop of fairies. It was the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen in her life. She couldn't restrain herself. She stepped into the clearing and she began to dance around the fire with the fairies. And the fairies, they welcomed her. They gave her food to eat and wine to drink. And they danced and they danced all through the night until the sun began to rise. And as it did, the four leprechauns, they packed away their instruments and each one of them shook hands with Eileen because she had been such a wonderful dancer. And so the leprechauns, they went on their way and the fairies went on their way and Eileen, she went on her way, back through the trees, back to the path. And the moment she set foot upon that path, she collapsed on the ground, screaming in agony. She looked down at her feet that were causing her so much pain. And they were nothing but bloodied stumps. And so she dragged herself along her belly with her hands, all the way back along the path, back to her home. And when she arrived at her cottage, she found the door hanging off its hinges, the windows sm smashed, the roof caved in. She had never seen it in such a state in her life. So she kept dragging herself onward, back along the road, into town, hoping, hoping that someone would be awake at this hour in the morning who might help her. When she arrived in town, it looked so different. It had changed so much. And it was still too early in the morning for anyone to be awake. Eventually, she came upon a puddle in the road. And in it, she saw her reflection. Oh, Eileen was a young woman of 19. But the face she saw in that puddle wrinkled and haggard with hair grey and matted all oh, because when she had stepped into that clearing she had entered the fairy world and time there flows differently when she stepped back onto the path back into our world the three hundred years that she had spent dancing with the fairies caught up on her all at once wearing her feet away to nothing and aging her impossibly 
leaving her in a world where everyone she had ever known and ever loved was long dead. And those fairies she had danced with, and the leprechauns she had shaken hands with, each one of them would have known that something like this might happen to Eileen, and not one of them warned her, because not one of them cared. So yeah, that's that's the grim leprechaun story I like to tell sometimes, when people are misbehaving or if they if they want the horror. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much, Eros. <laughs> oh, um, Girl of Mahagut. Girl of Mila Mahagut. Why did that take me a moment to remember? Everyone knows Girl of Mahagut. <laughs> All right. Oh, Queen Maeve. Queen Maeve. <laughs> I do like Queen Maeve. Um, I suppose I could try the pillow talk. I've only actually told that once, and that was for the video. But look, I'm supposed to be practicing today anyway. Um, I may as well give it a go. Yeah, I'll give, I'll give, I'll give the pillow talk a go, at least. <clears throat> I could, I could maybe try telling the entire talk. I think I remember enough of it to actually give an outline. But no, I'm not doing that. No. <laughs> Maybe for charity, but not now. <laughs> All right. So one night at the great fortress of Rathcrown, Queen Maeve and her husband of the month, Elil, they lay in their lovely bed, their sumptuous bed. And Elil, he's thinking to himself. You're a lucky woman, Maeve, to be married to someone like me. I am a mighty king. I am a great leader of men, a fierce warrior. And sure, you're a kept woman with me as a husband. You're very fortunate to have me. And Maeve, she thinks about this and she responds. A kept woman, am I? Fortunate to have you, am I? I am a fortunate woman, Elil McMata. But not because I married you. I am one of the most feared rulers in Ireland, one of the most respected rulers that Connacht has ever had. And it's you who's a kept man, Elil McMata, for I am far richer than you. And so the argument began. Elil and Maeve trading barbs, each one convinced that they were richer than the other. But words Words could only take them so far in such a disagreement. So instead they sent for their servants. And they had their servants bring through the sleeping chamber every bit of wealth each one of them owned. All of their fine clothes, their cooking pots, their bronze, their gold, their silver. Down to the smallest thimble. But you also have to understand that this was ancient Ireland. Wealth wasn't what we traditionally consider wealth today. They also brought through all of their cattle, all of their pigs from the hills and the fields, all of their sheep and every bit of livestock down to the smallest chicken. And each was compared and valued and it all seemed perfectly equal. Except for one thing. One very important thing. You see, years and years before, one of Maeve's cows had given birth to a calf, a mighty white calf. That calf was named Finvanach. And that calf had grown 
and groan and groan and groan until it was a huge, mighty bull capable of taking 30 or 40 warriors on its back at a time. But unfortunately, Finvenach, Finvenach had apparently learned the ways of sexism and patriarchy and refused, refused to be owned by a woman. And so it left Maeve's herds and became Elil's bull. And in all of Maeve's herd, there was not one bull that was the match of Finvenach. And so it seemed Elil was the richer of the two. But Maeve had heard a story. A story of the brown bull of Cooley, the pride of the province of Ulster. That was the equal of Finvenach. It belonged to a herdsman named Dara. And so Maeve gathered her servants and she sent a message to Dara. That she would give him land in the county of Mayo. That she would give him 30 herds of heifers. And the friendship of her own thighs. If he but granted Maeve a loan of the brown bull of Cooley for one year. Just one year. Now at first, Dara was only too eager to accept such a generous offer. And so, in honour of it, he ordered a huge feast and that Maeve's messengers be guests of honour. But, as the night wore on, after Dara himself had gone to bed, Maeve's messengers, they began to take on a little more drink than they should have. And one says, it's a very generous host we have tonight. Is there a more generous host in all of Ireland, I wonder? Oh, you're very right, says another one of the messengers. You're very, very right. And it's generous of him, not just this feast, but to grant our queen her request. Ah, well, says a third messenger. It's very well he did grant the request. Because if he hadn't given the lend of that bull willingly, our queen would have only taken it by force. She'd have rallied all of Ireland to do it if she needed to. Adora's butler, who had been serving them, overheard this. And he went and reported it to Dora immediately. And so the next day, when the messengers were preparing to leave with the brown bull of Cooley, and were puzzled by, by the fact that it had not been brought out to them yet. Dora appeared. And he said, Maeve would take my bull by force if I didn't give it willingly. Is that what you said? Well, she can prove it. She can come here by force and take it because that is now the only way she will get it. So Maeve's servants, they were returned to Rathcrown and they reported this disappointment to Maeve. And she was not best pleased. And she did rally the armies of Ireland and she launched the greatest cattle raid that has ever occurred on this land. But that is another and a far longer story. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I did pretty good, seeing as I don't tell that story. I just bullshitted it out of my arse the entire way. Just how I do everything. <laughs> I think that went okay. Um, I'm actually very pleased. All right. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Piper. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut my phone up. It's been annoying. Um.
Uh, no, what, what, what are you, what? Stop doing weird things, phone. All right. <laughs> so now, um, let's see. I think I'll practice the Alpluo Chris, the most important one. So I'm going to try and do that. Um, that's a good story. It's about what the Alpluo is, is a kind of newt. Some say it's a fairy newt, a newt from the fairy world. Some say it is a fairy in the form of a newt. But what they do is if you're sleeping in damp grass or near a body of water, they will come and climb into your mouth and go down into your stomach and they will eat your food, essentially. And they will lodge themselves down there and they will grow and grow and grow and they will reproduce endlessly and you will be starving constantly starving no matter how much you eat and no matter how much you eat you will be wasting away and becoming weaker and thinner and the only way to get rid of them is to eat well, you'll, you'll find the only way to get rid, rid of them in a moment I'll, when I do the story. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give it a go. <clears throat> Many years ago, there was a wealthy farmer. He was doing very well for himself. And because he was doing so well for himself, he was able to ha hire many farmhands to help him take in his harvest coming up to the end of the season. I, I say he had them help him take in his harvest. Really, he paid them to do it for him. And he would stand and watch in what he would refer to as a supervisory capacity. But watching all these men do all his work for him, he began to get very sleepy, especially with the, the warm, hot sun coming down on him. And he decided now there's this lovely patch down in the back field. It's got some nice shade. It's down by the river. I think I'll have, go there, have a little lie down. So he goes and he has his lie down, down by the river, next to the water. And he wakes up. It's roughly four hours later. And he is famished. He's starving. So he rushes back home and he gets inside and his wife says, where have you been? No one has seen you for hours. We've been worried. I, I just went to have to the back field to have a little lie down, rest my eyes for a moment. And the tiredness, it must have overtaken me. But listen, I am starving. I am famished. What's for dinner? So the wife, she gives him his dinner. And at first he's happy. At first he's delighted. It's a lovely dinner, a big dinner. Lots of spuds, lots of pork, the mainstays of an Irish meal. But then he's finished and he's still hungry. If anything, he's hungrier than he was before. And he doesn't know what to do. He feels weak, he feels faint. His wife sends him up to bed, hoping he'll be all right in the morning. And the morning comes, and he's worse. His cheeks are sunken. He's lost weight, lost inches from his gut. So the wife, she doesn't know what to do. She sends for the doctor. And the doctor comes and examines him, and he says, There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing at all wrong with you. And he leaves. The husband, the farmer, he's in bits. He can't do anything. He's starving. He's eating as much as he can. Nothing's happening. So they send for another doctor. And he says to the doctor, the farmer says to the doctor, can you not hear it? Can you not hear the footsteps inside there? Like something running around in there, squirming about. The doctor says, no, I don't hear anything. I hear your heart. I hear your lungs, I hear the gurgles of your stomach, but I don't hear creatures in there. So the doctor leaves. 
and they keep sending for more and more doctors and they pay each and every one and not one of them can help. And they spend so much money on doctors that the farm is starting to suffer. He's not as rich as he used to be. Until finally, a homeless man comes and begs the use of the barn for the night. They grant it to him. And he overhears some of the farmhands talking about what's happening to the farmer. And he decides, you know, they've been nice to me. They let me sleep in this barn. I'll see if I can help. So he knocks on the door of the main house. The wife comes out to him and he says, I hear your husband is in a bad way. I hear none of the doctors can help. I think I might know what the problem is. If you'd like me to come in and have a look. And the wife, she's thinking to herself, listen, we have had 50 different doctors come in here. Not one of them has been able to help. We've spent nearly every penny we have on this. You might as well. So she leads him inside. And he takes a look at the farmer. And at this stage, he's skin and bones. His chest, it looks like a toast rack with wet tissue paper draped over it he is emaciated so the homeless man he asks him some questions did you lie down by a river or in wet grass recently the farmer he says yes yes i did you're hungry no matter how much you eat Yes, yes, I am. And you hear a sound of something running around inside you. You can feel something wriggling and squirming inside. I can, I can. I know what this is. You've got the Alpluchra in you. I'll tell you what you need. What you need is bacon. Lots and lots of bacon, as much bacon as we can get into this house and get down your throat. That is what you need. And the farmer, he was very confused and the wife, he, she was even more confused. But they think, well, we may as well try something. So they send someone off to buy as much bacon as they can. They bring an entire side of bacon in, two sides of bacon. They cook it up. And the homeless man sits the farmer down at the dinner table, gives him a huge plate of bacon and says, eat it. Every single bite, everything I put in front of you, eat every bit of it. And the farmer, he's so thin and emaciated at this point, he has trouble even swallowing. He struggles through eating as much as he can, forcing as much of it down as he can. And when the homeless man was finally satisfied that he'd eaten enough. He led him back out to the river and he told, him, told the farmer to lie on his stomach with his mouth over the water. And he was laying there for five or ten minutes and suddenly he felt something rustling around in his gut and it came up up through his throat and clambered onto his tongue, a tiny little creature like a newt. And it was panting desperately as if in dreadful thirst. And looking down at the water, sniffing at it, he would lean out, standing upon his tongue, looking down at the water, and then would run back inside in panic. It would do this three or four times before deciding finally to jump straight into the river. And the farmer went to get up, but the homeless man, he said, no, get back down there. That's only one of them. As an hour or two passed, more and more of these creatures crawled up through the farmer's throat, perched upon his tongue, and each one jumped into the river with a plop. The farmer tried to get up again after the last of the tiny little creatures had leapt in. But the homeless man said, no, 
stay down there. The first one hasn't come out yet. The mother. The big one. And so they waited. And they waited. And they waited. And eventually the homeless man was worried it wouldn't come out at all. But the farmer, he felt a horrible, gut-wrenching pain. And something came moving through him. His throat bulged with it. And a snout, a snout taking up his entire distended mouth forced its way out, bulging out of his mouth, forcing its little legs out from between his lips, from the corners of his lips, and pulled itself into the water. So the homeless man helped the farmer up and led him back to the house. He was three months recovering, eating all of the eggs and pork and apples and potatoes and beef, but never, ever bacon, never bacon ever again. And the farmer, he never laid down in wet grass or by a river, no matter how tired he was, for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Albuquerque is so body horror. I love it. <laughs> I would love to see like John Carpenter or someone. Is that who I'm thinking of? I think it's I think it's John Carpenter, the guy who did the thing. I would love to see someone like him tackle the Albuquerque. I think that would be great. All right. Um. A L P. And then, yeah, it's two words. So the first word is A-L-P and the second word is L-U-A-C-H-R-A. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's pretty gross. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to do it for, um, my next proper video was going to be, was originally going to be the Far and Fair Garta, but there's, there's a couple of things wrong with it. Like, while there is def definitely documentation that the Far Garta was something people believed in, um, there is not an awful lot of information about it. Um, there, there's like a sentence that gets repeated in lots of different forms. There's a little bit more information that comes out of WB Yates, but we all know how I feel about him. Uh, I can't find anything to um, to support it anywhere else. What Yates said, so I'm not bothering with Yates. So yeah, there's not an awful lot on the Far Garta. There is a lot more on the Fair Garta, the Hungry Grass. But there's not anything that really works as a narrative as a narrative story it mostly um it's mostly don't go traveling without food you may get the fair garta and little snippets of stories about people who went traveling without food and got the fair garta and then went somewhere and ate and then they were fine it's not much of a story so um so i've decided to make it a supernatural starvation video instead so I'm going to do the Far Garta, the Fair Garta, and I'll throw in the Alpluacra as well. Because all three together became more popular uh, after the 1840s for absolutely no reason. There was no massive event that may have triggered that. Um, and we're going to be talking about the completely non-existent event that may have triggered that and how that may have been precipitated by the actions of certain nations and their governments. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a heavy one. <laughs> but yeah, because because there's no Fair Goethe story really, and there's no Far Goethe story really, I want to do an Alpluacra story as 
the story part. So I'll do I'll do that. I've been rambling. I get very rambling. <laughs> Um, all right. I think then, um, the one I remember best after that, that I want to practice is Michael Roberts. I'm going to give a little bit of background for Michael Roberts. Um, I was look, I was looking up stories on the Dukas archive for where the story begins, which was a podcast the Leprechaun Museum was doing over the main lockdown and I found reference to a necromancer named Michael Roberts which is a gloriously like anticlimactic name for a necromancer first of all but um I looked him up on the Dukas archive and there's only three entries about him in total um about the figure rather than like some random guy named michael roberts doing ordinary things there's only three magic michael robertses or Mike magic michael roberts stories oh shit shit i get to use mike magic mike as as a fucking thumbnail thing now that's amazing i'm going to do that but yeah there's only three stories about him in the dukas archive and I have found no trace of him anywhere else at all. So I feel like I'm going to be getting to, like, be one of the first people to resurrect this story, this figure, from... It must have been extremely localised folklore. It's only really... The three I found were all from the Midlands. Um, and all from, like, the the... Leash Kildare Carlo area so it must have been very and I don't mean like spread throughout those three counties I mean from around the area where those three counties meet like around Athai, Cretyard, Carlo Town that kind of area um so incredibly localized which I'm very happy about. <laughs> I'm I I could be the first person to tell these stories in like actual decades. So <laughs> I'm just excited to bring them back. Um I have practiced this story a little bit before. Um I have an intro for it that that gets a little bit um <laughs> it gets a little bit uh What's a good word for it? Um, it gets a little bit extremely anti-colonial. Um, but that that's all right. It's grand. It's it's fine. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna try Michael Roberts. <coughs> Years ago in Ireland, there was a necromancer by the name of Michael Roberts. He wasn't a man of any great wealth. He didn't really use his powers to make money. But he was a man of great cunning. And, mm, no, I'm, I'm missing a bit. I'm going to try that again. I'm going to start that again. See, I don't write these down. What I do is, um... Because, honestly, writing them down makes makes it harder for me. I feel I try more to stick to a specific script, and that always throws me off. What I do is I just keep telling them until I'm able to tell them from memory. Uh, every time I tell a story, it's a little bit different, or dramatically different, as was the case with the, uh, with the pillow talk there. <clears throat> Long ago in the Midlands of Ireland, there was a necromancer named Michael Roberts. Now, I've only found three stories about Michael Roberts. They all involve him performing some kind of magic, but not one of them actually involves the dead. 
even though he gets referred to as a necromancer. Still, personally, I like to picture him riding across the night sky, sitting astride the ghastly reanimated corpse of Oliver Cromwell. Using the noose from his posthumous hanging as reins to guide and steer the awful undead monster. But that's just me. That's just something I like to think about. Now, Michael Roberts, he wasn't a man of any great wealth or means. He was a man of great cunning, of great cleverness and of great trickery. Uh, one day he hears that the town market in the village of Athai, had a very good price going on pigs. And he thought to himself, now that's a good idea. I could head down to the market in Athai. I could sell some pigs and I could use the money. I can use the money to have a great day at the market. I can get myself some lovely oat cakes. I can get myself some nice sausages. And you know, I've been needing new boots for a long time now. You see, the only problem with this logic was that Michael Roberts didn't own any pigs to sell. And he wasn't really the kind of man who was best suited to stealing animals. But anyway, he set off down the road towards Atai, and he takes his walking stick with him. And as he was walking down the road, he slapped two white boulders across the rump. And he said, get up there now. And from each boulder, four little protrusions pushed out from the bottom that ended in trotters. And from the front would emerge a little snout, followed by jaws, followed by a head and ears. And from the back of each boulder curled a little pigtail. And so he slapped the two pigs with his stick and he guided them down the road to the market in Atai. And when he arrived, these were two very fine, fat, plump, handsome pigs. He found no bother in getting a price for them that he found satisfactory. And the farmer who bought them, Michael Roberts, he helped drive the pigs into that farmer's cart. He took his money and he watched the farmer as he drove down the road, staring directly at the two pigs, keeping his eyes fixed on them, until the farmer rolled down the road and off over the horizon. And once he could no longer see the pigs or the farmer's cart, Michael Roberts, he turned around into the market to spend his money. And he got himself some lovely sausages. He got himself some wonderful oat cakes with honey. And he went and bought a gorgeous new pair of leather boots. And he was just sitting down on a doorstep to put on his new boots. When suddenly, the farmer he had sold the pigs to came storming up to him. Those two pigs you sold me, they've just turned into two boulders in the back of my cart. I was wondering why they'd suddenly turned so quiet and I turned around and it was just two rocks. You're going to give me my money back. Of course, Michael, he'd spent the farmer's money. It's already gone. He couldn't give it back. And so he stood up. He clapped his hands together. He looked the farmer dead in the eye and he ran like fuck. He ran down the street, through the back roads and everything, winding and twisting all around until he saw a house with an open door. He jumped inside, he ran up the stairs and he hid under the bed. The farmer saw what door he'd run into. He came stalking in and he looked under the tables and he looked inside the wardrobes. But eventually he went upside, he went upstairs he looked under the bed and he could see Michael's new boots poking out from under the covers and so he grabbed Michael by the angles and started dragging him out and Michael he clung to the underside of the bed desperate to stay where he was but then he started to laugh 
If you want my new boot so much, you can just have them. And the farmer, he fell back, holding onto Michael's legs by the ankles and finding nothing attached to them. The legs had been popped off Michael's body and seeing this, the farmer, he fainted. And Michael Roberts, he crawled out on his hands laughing to himself. He popped his legs back on as casually as he had put the boots on earlier. He left one of his oat cakes on the farmer's chest. And when the farmer woke up, Michael Roberts was long gone. <laughs> That's very suspicious. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you like it, Hecate. <laughs> Koo. Koo. That's your name. I don't know why I didn't remember that straight away. I'm glad you like it, Koo. <laughs> yeah, I... I, I obviously added in the Oliver Cromwell bit because I'm a monster who must be stopped. But um, I think it's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very suspicious that it's also the name of an estate agent. Very suspicious. All right, so actually... Is it, is it a limerick story? I think it is. Um, I need to check this anyway because I've forgotten the fella's name. Or not his name, but his father's name. Yeah, it is a limerick story. Um, Garo Dierle is what I want to practice next. Okay. Garo Dierle is a weird one. Um, it's very weird. Okay. So, that's me reminded of that. So... I'm gonna... I'm going to give Garo Dierla a try and and we'll see what we can do. This one might take me a, a couple of attempts because it's a, it's a very strange one. It has a strange structure to it. <coughs> Actually, I need to look up one more thing. <laughs> There's a lake involved there, isn't there? What's the name of the lake? Left okay. <clears throat> now it said that Morris Earle the first Earl of Desmond, once went for a walk down by Loch Gar, and he saw, completely unexpectedly, a woman sitting by the lakeside, brushing out golden hair, completely and utterly naked, and gorgeous in every facet, and next to her, a cloak of white feather. Now, Morris had heard, as many people have, of the swan women who shed their cloak of feathers and take on the forms of gorgeous human women. And when they put their cloak back on, they become a swan again. And he thought to himself, I would love to have that swan woman for myself. Because all the men in these stories about shape-shifting women, not one of them has any idea of consent. 
They're all very rapey. And so he snuck up through the bushes and he saw her swan cloak. He got close to it and he snatched it away. But she only laughed. I always knew you were here, Morris. I always knew you were coming. You don't have to take my cloak. I came here for you. I came here to give you exactly what you wanted. And so they, oh. now how do they usually put it in the old sagas? They coupled is the term that usually gets used. And she revealed that she wasn't any ordinary swan woman. She was Anya, one of the two of the Danon. She said, I know now, Morris, you have put a baby inside me. And he will be a son. And he will be one of the greatest, most wonderful creatures ever to walk this earth. But you will not see me now for nine months. And after those nine months have passed, and I have brought you your son, you will never see me again. And so she left. And Morris, he was both excited and distraught. He was delighted to have got what he wanted, and even more delighted that now he knew he would have a son. And not just any son, a son with the blood of the two of the Danon. That would be incredible. A son prophesied to be one of the most wonderful creatures ever to walk the earth. But he desperately missed Anya at the same time. And he searched for her endlessly along the lakeside, through the mountains. But never finding any. Eventually, though, the nine months passed. And there was a knock at his castle door. And he ran down to answer it himself, not waiting for the servants. And there was Anya. And in her arms was bundled a tiny baby. And she said, Morris, I have brought you our son. And you will raise him. But you must promise me one thing. Promise me one very, very important thing. Our son, he will do amazing things, incredible things, impossible things. You must never, ever be surprised by anything he does. If you are ever surprised by our son's actions, he will be lost to you forever. And his name, his name is Garold. And when he becomes the Earl after you, he will be Garold Irla, just as you are Morris Irla. So Morris, heavy with this situation, knowing and Anya will never return to him after this. He takes his son in his arms and he looks down at this beautiful child. And he says, I promise, I will never be surprised by anything he does. I give you my word. Garold, he grew up to be a fine, handsome young man, interested in everything, talented at everything. He could speak six languages. He could ride, he could weave, he could sew. He could do all of the skills of the nobility and carry out many of the skills of the working people at the same time. And he was beloved by everyone. The nobility loved him. The working people loved him, and he was respected. And even though his father was still alive and still Earl, they all called him Garod Irla, the Earl Garod, anyway. And when he reached the age of 16, and upon his 16th birthday, his father threw a huge party for him, inviting people from all across the country. And Garod Irla, he entertained everyone, fascinated everyone, amazed everyone with his incredible dancing. He would do flips and bounds across the hall. 
But one woman was unimpressed. One woman of his own age. And she danced with him. And she kept up with him. Every feat he performed, she equaled. And they were flipping and turning across the tables, cartwheeling here and there. Edible. A son prophesied to be one of the most wonderful creatures ever to walk the earth. But he desperately missed Anya at the same time. And he searched for her endlessly along the lakeside, through the mountains. But never finding any. Eventually, though, the nine months passed. And there was a knock at his castle door. And he ran down to answer it himself, not waiting for the servants. And there was Anya. And in her arms was bundled a tiny baby. And she said, Morris, I have brought you our son. And you will raise him. But you must promise me one thing. Promise me one very, very important thing. Our son, he will do amazing things, incredible things, impossible things. You must never, ever be surprised by anything he does. If you are ever surprised by our son's actions, he will be lost to you forever. And his name, his name is Garold. And when he becomes the Earl after you, he will be Garrowed Irla, just as you are Morris Irla. So Morris, heavy with this situation, knowing that Onya will never return to him after this, he takes his son in his arms and he looks down at this beautiful child. And he says, I promise. I will never be surprised by anything he does. I give you my word. Garold, he grew up to be a fine, handsome young man, interested in everything, talented at everything. He could speak six languages. He could ride, he could weave, he could sew, he could do all of the skills of the nobility and carry out many of the skills of the working people at the same time. And he was beloved by everyone. The nobility loved him. The working people loved him. And he was respected. And even though his father was still alive and still Earl, they all called him Garod Irla, the Earl Garod, anyway. And when he reached the age of 16, and upon his 16th birthday, his father threw a huge party for him, inviting people from all across the country. And Garrod Erla, he entertained everyone, fascinated everyone, amazed everyone with his incredible dancing. He would do flips and bounds across the hall. But one woman was unimpressed, one woman of his own age. She danced with him and she kept up with him. Every feat he performed, she equaled. And they were flipping and turning across the tables, cartwheeling here and there. Everyone amazed, everyone delighted. But his father showed no sign of surprise, just smiling in pride. But Garrod himself, he began to become frustrated that his every deed was being matched by this woman even though he liked her a lot because of it. But he wanted to show that he could do something better. So eventually he set a bottle upon the table. He asked everyone to clear some space. He backed up, he ran, he flipped twice, he flipped three times, he flipped into the bottle. And he flipped back out again, jumping onto the ground as if he had never shrunk himself down small enough to fit in a bottle and leapt out of it again. And his father, Morris's jaw dropped. My God, I never knew you could do that. 
And then a howling wind swept through the castle. It blew the tapestries off the wall, the cloths off the tables, the clothing off people. And when the wind died down, Garo Dierla was gone. His father, Morris, had broken the gesh laid upon him by, by, by Garo's mother, Anya. Broken the gesh to never be surprised at anything he did, no matter how amazing. So his son was lost to him forever. Every seven years, Garod can be seen riding forth from Loch Gur upon a white horse, leading a company of soldiers through the sky, patrolling Limerick. But only every seven years. Yeah, I need more practice with that one. It's a weird one. It has an odd structure to it. Um, and it doesn't really have much of an ending. Um, that's that's a problem with some with some folklore. Um, some of the stories don't have a proper ending. Not like not like one that feels satisfying. So you have to you have to work with them a good bit. Um, yeah, I'll need to work on that one some more. But, um, now I do at least feel ready to film the Alp Luacra story, which I'm going to do soon, probably on Monday. And that'll be up shortly after because it doesn't take much editing. I'm going to film the, the, the analysis of the supernatural starvation after that. And um, I have to finish the Marrow Reloaded script. Yeah, Swan Princess vibes. Um, it's strange. The um, <coughs> Morris uh, Morris Irla, He his surname is Fitzmorris. Uh, the Fitzmorris family actually has an odd association with kidnapping bird women. It's very weird. Um, there, there's a few stories about a Fitzmaurice kidnapping a bird woman. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know why they just, they just like their bird women. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still working on the, the Marrow Reloaded script. It's not the best reputation for a family to have. It's also a really strange one. Because it's specifically bird women. Um, yeah, I'm working on the Marrow Reloaded script at the moment. The script is almost entirely me talking about how Thomas Crofton Croker wasn't actually a very good folklorist. And, and probably invented the name Marrow. Um... And <laughs> and was guilty of plagiarism and and probably forcing other people to plagiarize. <laughs> the nineteenth century folklorists were bad at their jobs and they were romanticists and they romanticized everything and they were they were more concerned with the romanticism than they were with the actual folklore preservation. It's not just Yates. He's the worst one, but it's not just Yates. It, it was all of the 19th century lot. I, I would like it if people would would focus more on the likes of, of Seamus DeLarga and, and, and Liam Danaher and, and that kind, them people, but who were doing their job in the, thir in the 30s. But being fair to the 19th century ones, they were operating in a time before there were any, like, before there was formalized training in how to collect folklore or even a formalized approach to it. But still, they were romanticists and it makes things annoying. Um, <laughs> I hope everyone has had a good time. Uh, I think I'm going to leave off here for now. Um... 
<laughs> I might do that. I might do that. Oh, don't get me started on the Brothers Grimm. Do not get me st I hate the Brothers Grimm. <laughs> I actually hate the Brothers Grimm so much. You know, you hear about the, the, the Feast of Ostara. That, that's supposed to have been this, this ancient pagan festival. I, I can't remember which of the Brothers Grimm's, Grimm it was. I think it was Jacob. Um, he was the one who came up with the idea of the Feast of Ostara. The, it's, it's, it's mostly tracing from his writings. But he didn't actually have evidence. He just assumed there was a feast and he at that time of year and he just gave it the name Ostara and said it must have been about a goddess and I'm so annoyed I'm, I I might like Easter has its Easter is a mess it's a clusterfuck like, people going on about how it's actually about Ishtar, which is supposed to be pronounced Easter, which it's not. And eggs and, and rabbits are not the symbols of Ishtar. The symbols of Ishtar are fucking... I can't remember the other one, but the main one is lions. Um, <laughs> and even if it was, there's only two languages that even call that feast Easter. The others all call it some variation of Pascha. As in the Paschal season, which is a big thing in Catholicism, which is linguistically connected to Pesach, which is a Hebrew word for Passover. Which happens at the same time of year and does involve eating eggs and does have an association with rabbits. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. But just as Christianity is a spin-off of Judaism, Easter is a spin-off of Passover. That's the origin. Stop making up origins. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm going crazy. <laughs> okay. I think I'm going to sign off. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I will do video rants on this stuff at some point. I might just... I might not even script them. I might just turn on a camera and unleash thank you and good evening goodbye i'll probably upload this at some point i can download it off twitch now oh here we go again how do i end this oh there it is stop